Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the privilege of being here today. How wonderful it is to have your holy word in a world that is so confused that it doesn't know where to turn. Thank you for giving us the certainty that we find in your holy word. We ask, Father, that as we open the pages of your holy book, that your Holy Spirit will be with here, with us here through the ministration of your angels, that we might be able to comprehend the great things that you have in store for us from your holy word. We thank you, Lord, for all of those who have come to study your word, and we ask that you will bless those who are on their way. And we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. This evening, as we begin, I would like to review what we studied in our last lecture because it's foundational for what we're going to deal with in our topic today. If you remember, we found that God married Israel at Mount Sinai. And he wanted Israel to be his only, to obey his laws and to remain absolutely pure and uncontaminated from the surrounding nations. But we found in our study that very early in Israel's history, she apostatized from God. And Ezekiel chapter 16, as well as chapter 23, tells us that Israel became a harlot because she embraced the teachings and practices of the surrounding nations. The Bible calls these practices the abominations of the nations. In other words, Israel assimilated the abominations of the nations. And in this way, she became a harlot. She abandoned the husband of her youth. As we studied, she also fornicated with the kings of the earth, with the kings of different nations, forming political alliances. And instead of depending on God as her source of strength, she started depending on these alliances with other kings. We also noticed in our study that Israel covered herself or decked herself with silver and with gold to attract attention to herself. And as a result, God spoke in no uncertain terms to his unfaithful wife, in Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 32, by saying these words, You are an adulterous wife who takes strangers instead of her husband. You see, she was pay playing the harlot. She was an adulterous wife, if you please, because she had the kings of the nations as lovers instead of the Lord her God. In Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 30, God speaks even more graphically. He says, how degenerate is your heart, says the Lord God. Seeing you do all these things, the deeds of a brazen harlot. harlot. That word brazen in the Hebrew means to exercise autocratic control. It means to get one's way or to be domineering. In other words, Israel became a domineering harlot, wanting her own way, and wanting to exercise control and dominion. We noticed in our study last time that Israel had daughters, daughter harlots, who shared her point of view and also assimilated the pagan practices of the surrounding nations. And we studied that Israel shed innocent blood. The blood of those who opposed her agenda were slaughtered and slain by Israel. And therefore God told Israel, you are going to drink the cup of my wrath to the very dregs. And destruction is going to come from the four corners of the earth. And you will fall and you will be destroyed. In fact, God said, the very kings that you have fornicated with, the kings that you have assimilated all of these abominable practices from, they are going to rise and they are going to slay you and they're going to leave you naked. But we noticed in our study that even in the midst of the apostasy, God had a faithful remnant. And God placed 
his seal upon this faithful remnant who sighed and cried because of the abominations that were being committed among his people. And when the destruction of Jerusalem came by Nebuchadnezzar, we find that this faithful remnant that was sealed on their foreheads, according to Ezekiel chapter 9, was spared from the destruction. When the adulterous wife was destroyed, God's faithful people who sighed and cried because of the abominations that God's own people were committing, they were spared. Now it's not like God had not warned Israel about the dangers that she was going to face when she entered the promised land. In Leviticus chapter 18 and verses 26 to 30, we find God's warning to Israel. Notice what it says there. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, and shall not commit any of these abominations, either any of your own nation or any stranger who dwells among you. For all these abominations the men of the land have done, who were before you, and thus the land is defiled, lest the land vomit you out also when you defile it, as it vomited out the nations that were before you. You know, you get the imagery that even the land was nauseated by the abominations that were being committed by these nations. Verse 29, For whoever commits any of these abominations, the persons who commit them shall be cut off from among the pe their people. Therefore you shall keep my ordinance, so that you do not commit any of these abominable customs which were committed before you, and that you do not defile yourselves by them. I am the Lord your God. Time and again in this passage, God warns Israel not to partake in the abominations of the nations of Canaan where they were going to enter. Notice 2 Chronicles 36 and verse 14, and this is only a sampling of texts. All throughout the Pentateuch, or the five books of Moses, the first five books of Moses, we find God warning Israel about not becoming defiled with the practices and doctrines which are called the abominations of the nations. 2 Chronicles 36 and verse 14. Moreover, all the leaders of the priests, notice it started with the priesthood, all the leaders of the priests and the people transgressed more and more according to all the abominations of the nations and defiled the house of the Lord which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. In other words, time and again God says that Israel, in spite of the, the fact that he had warned them not to become defiled with the abominations of the nations, they became defiled with the practices, with the teachings of these pagan nations. Now as we noticed in our study last time, the Christian church has repeated the history of ancient Israel. The Apostle Paul, as we noticed in our last lecture, said that uh, he had betrothed the Corinthians or the church to Christ, as a vir to, to Christ as a virgin. In other words, the church in its original state, as we find in the book of Acts, was a pure church. It was the bride of Jesus Christ. But very early in her history, we noticed last night, that uh, the apostasy entered the Christian church. The man of sin sat in the temple of God, showing himself to be God. And of course, the temple of God is the church. Very early in the history of the early church, we're talking about even towards the end of the first century, the church began assimilating the beliefs practices and customs of the pagan nations that they came in contact with. And thus, the church of Jesus Christ, the bride of Jesus, whom Paul had betrothed to Jesus Christ, who was supposed to be a chaste virgin to Jesus, now became Babylon. In other words, the church repeated the history of God's Old Testament people. Even, as I mentioned, at the latter part of the first century, she allowed the practices of the pagan nations, Rome and other nations, to encroach upon herself. And thus she lost her simplicity and her purity. And in the book of Revelation chapter 17, we find a description of that church that had apostatized from Jesus Christ. 
In fact, you know, it's interesting. I'm going to share with you some details that we studied last time. But before I share these details, I'd just like to say that a few years ago I was speaking in Argentina. And I presented uh, the topic that I gave last night, a little bit different slant, but I presented it, all of the characteristics of the apostate church in Revelation chapter 17. But at the end of the presentation, I never mentioned who these characteristics applied to. Well, the next morning, you know, I had interviews with the students in the morning, and I preached in the evening. So the next morning, a student came to the office and wanted an interview with me. I said, sure, come on in. She looked at me in the eye and she said, Pastor Bohr, I want you to know that you offended me last night. I said, really? I'm really sorry I offended you. What do you mean, I offended you? She says, well, you spoke badly about my church. And I said, really? I don't remember mentioning any church last night in my sermon. I didn't mention any church. I just gave a, a, a series of characteristics. She says, well, but you could tell by the characteristics what church you were talking about. I said, well, if you could tell by the characteristics what church I was talking about, then you should take it to heart because I didn't even need to identify the church to you. Now let's take a look at those characteristics again. The Bible is graphic and clear about the identity of the harlot or Babylon. First of all, I want you to notice that in Scripture, a woman represents the church. A pure woman represents the pure church of Jesus Christ. A harlot woman represents a fallen church. And I want you to notice in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 1, that it speaks about a harlot, which is an apostate church. It says there in Revelation 17 verse 1, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great what? Of the great harlot who sits on many waters. And by the way, her name is Babylon, according to verse 5. Now, you know, I looked in Scripture, I looked in the concordance of Scripture, and I discovered something very interesting. In the Old Testament, Babylon is never called a harlot. In the Old Testament, almost in every single case that the word harlot is used, it is applied to Israel. In other words, it's applied to God's people. In other words, in Revelation chapter 17, we're talking about the Christian church that has become Babylon. Now, I want you to notice several other interesting details about this church. First of all, it's called a harlot. In other words, it is a church, but it's an apostate church. Secondly, this is a church that has worldwide extent, global extent. You say, how do we know that? Notice Revelation 17 and verse 1 again. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Now what do the waters that she sits on represent? Well, let's go to verse 15 of chapter 17. It says, Then he said to me, The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Are those the same groups that the first angel's message goes to? Absolutely. So what is the purpose of the first angel's message? It's to warn people about Babylon and to call people to come out of Babylon. Because the message goes to the same groups of people that Babylon controls and dominates. Are you with me on this point? Now I want you to notice something else that identifies this church, this apostate church. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 2 tells us with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication. Is that true of Israel also? Absolutely. With whom the kings of the earth committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. We'll come back to that later. Let me ask you, is this church involved with the political powers of the world? With the civil powers of the world? Yes, it's not only a church, but it's a church that, it, that is involved in the state or is involved with the kings or rulers of the earth. In other words, it's a church that's involved in political matters. I want you to notice that this harlot, this apostate church, also has daughters, just like Israel had daughters that shared her spirit. Notice Revelation chapter 17 and verse 5. Revelation 17 and verse 5. And on her forehead, this is of the harlot, a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great. The what? The mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. 
Now, if she, if she is the mother of harlots, must she have daughters who are also harlots? Absolutely. At some point in her history, she had daughters. After she had existed for a while, she had daughters that share many of the practices and teachings that she embraced or that she has. In other words, it's a system that has daughters. Notice also the colors that this, that this apostate church majors in. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 4. The woman was arrayed in what? In purple and scarlet. What are the predominant colors that are used by this religious organization? Purple and scarlet. I want you to notice that she doesn't use blue. You'll never find blue in this system. And you say, why don't you find blue? Let's go to Numbers 15, verses 38 to 41. Numbers 15, 38 to 41. I'm going to tell you now why this system majors in purple and scarlet, but does not use blue. It says in Numbers chapter 15, verse 38, again, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel. Tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations. And to put a what? A blue thread in the tassels of the corners. Now why a blue thread? Let's continue reading. And you shall have the tassel that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them. What is the purpose of the blue? To remember all of the what? All of the commandments. Would the harlot do that? She can't wear blue. And so it says, And you shall have the tassel that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them. And notice, And that you may not follow the harlotry. What saves us from harlotry? Blue. Notice. It says, And that you may not follow the harlotry to which your own heart and your own eyes are inclined, and that you may remember and do all my commandments. We're coming back to this one a little later in our series. And be holy for your God. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. In other words, he's saying, I am your husband and you are my wife. You shall not be a harlot in order to remember not to be a harlot and to keep my commandments. You're going to wear this blue thread. Blue. With this religious system, you'll never find the color blue used, which is very, very interesting. Now, you'll notice also that this is a very rich apostate church that majors in silver and gold. Notice Revelation chapter 17 and verse 4. Revelation 17 verse 4. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with what? With gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. I want you to notice also that this church has a history stained in blood. In other words, it's a church that has persecuted God's faithful people and has shed their blood throughout her history. Notice Revelation chapter 17 and verse 6. Revelation 17 verse 6. I saw the woman, this is the harlot, drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. In other words, she's a murderess. She kills those who don't agree with her. Now I want you to notice also that Revelation 17 says that someday... The kings of the earth are going to hate her and they're going to make her naked just like happened with Israel in the Old Testament. Notice Revelation chapter 17 and verse 16. Revelation 17 verse 16. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, make her desolate and what? And naked, eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Is there a very clear parallel between God's Old Testament Israel and the Christian church? Absolutely. Both started out well, but both apostatized and became a harlot. And therefore God said that he was going to destroy both. But the particular issue that I want to deal with today has to do with the cup that this harlot has in her hand. I've left this 
till this moment because it's the central focus of the rest of our study together. Notice Revelation chapter 17 and verse 4. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup. What does she have in her hand? A golden cup. Now let me ask you, what's in the cup? Wine. You know, I want to share with you uh, an interesting pilgrimage that I had a few years ago. You know, I wanted to know what wine represented here in Revelation 17 because we're dealing with symbols. The woman is not a literal woman, it's a system. The waters are symbolic. You know, the, the gold and silver and precious stones are symbolic of the riches that this worldwide system has. So we're dealing with symbols. So I said the wine has to represent something. So I went to a Bible concordance and I looked up every reference to wine. And almost without exception, I found that, that the references to wine deal with literal wine. It didn't help me very much, you know, to look up the, the word wine. It would give you the impression that, that wine simply represents Ernest and Julio Gallo. <laughs> you know, that type of wine. But then I, I went back to Revelation chapter 17. I said, there has to be some way to determine what the wine represents. I look up all these references to wine and wine in a concordance, and it's dealing with literal wine. And then I read Revelation 17 verse 4 carefully. I said, oh, now I know what I need to do. Notice once again, verse 4. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup, and we know that the cup contains wine, right? Having in her hand a golden cup, but the wine is called something. What is it called? A golden cup full of abominations. In other words, her wine are her what? Her abominations. Because the cup has wine, but the wine is identified as her what? abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. Then I said, well, then I need to look up the word abominations. And when I looked up the word abominations, a whole scenario opened up to view, which I'm going to share with you in a few moments. Now let me ask you, what does the harlot do with this wine, according to Revelation 17? She's got it in the cup, you know, she's got her wine or her abominations in the cup. What does she do with the wine? Does she just drink it herself? No! She's not the only one intoxicated. She uses it to intoxicate the inhabitants of the earth. Notice Revelation chapter 17 and verse 2. Revelation 17 and verse 2. With whom the kings of the earth committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth were made what? Drunk with the wine of her fornication. Let me ask you, are the inhabitants of the earth made drunk with her abominations? Yes, because the wine are her abominations. Is that point clear in your mind? It's the abominations or the wine of Babylon that makes people drunk. Let me ask you something. How many of you have ever tried to give a Bible study to a drunk? It's impossible. I mean, because their mind is affected. There's no way that they can grasp or understand truth because they're intoxicated. And so this religious system has given her wine or her abominations to the nations, and the nations have drunk these, abom these abominations. They've drunk this wine, and as a result, truth doesn't appeal to them. It doesn't make sense to them. In fact, notice Jeremiah chapter 51 and verse 7, where there's a similar idea. Jeremiah 51 and verse 7. Babylon was a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made... All the earth, what? Drunk. The nation, nations drank her wine. This is not God's wine. This is whose wine? Babylon's wine. Therefore, the nations are what? Are deranged. Do you know what the word deranged there means? It means the nations are out of their mind. They cannot think straight, is what it's saying. In other words, the abominations of this system lead people to be mentally unbalanced, intoxicated in a way that they cannot grasp truth. They simply cannot understand the truth. It's like a drunkard. Now let me ask you, why did Babylon fall? Well, let's review the first angel's message, which comes before the fall of Babylon. The first angel's message teaches, and listen carefully, the first angel's message teaches that Jesus was sacrificed once for all. 
That's the gospel. Jesus doesn't have to die over and over again because the book of Hebrews said when he died, when he was sacrificed, he was sacrificed what? Once for all. We discovered also in the everlasting gospel that Jesus is our only and sufficient high priest. In other words, he is the only one who represents us before God because he's God and he is man. In order for an individual to bridge heaven and earth, he would have to be God to link us with God and he would have to be man to link us with man. A mere man cannot be an intercessor, cannot represent us before God because a man is only a man. In order to have an intercessor, both sides of the ladder have to be there. Divinity and humanity. We also noticed in the first angel's message that we're saved by Christ's righteousness alone. We studied this in our second lecture of the series. And that we are not justified by our works. We can never be saved by pilgrimages. We can never be saved by doing penance. We can never save by, be saved by what we do. We're saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. We noticed in the first angel's message that we need to reflect God's character to the world. God's character of love and mercy and goodness and righteousness. We notice in the first angel's message that we need to take care of our bodies and of our minds. We notice in the first angel's message that God wants us to keep his holy law. In fact, he says, fear me, which is linked with keeping God's commandments. We notice in the first angel's message that we are now living in the hour of God's judgment. We also notice that the first angel's message calls us to worship the creator and keep his holy Sabbath. We also notice that in the first angel's message, the dead are dead until they receive their reward at the resurrection. In other words, the first angel's message teaches a series of truths. Do you know why Babylon has fallen? Because Babylon rejected all of those truths. You see, the wine of Babylon is the opposite of the first angel's message. If Babylon had accepted the first angel's message, she would have the truth of God. She would have unfermented wine, if you please. Because the blood of Jesus was pure. It had no fermentation. But Babylon gives fermented wine. It's corrupted wine. It's abominable wine. But because Babylon rejected the first angel's message, she has intoxicated wine and she gives it to the nations. And that's the reason why she failed. Notice Revelation 14 and verse 8. Revelation 14 and verse 8. And another angel followed saying, Babylon is fallen is fallen, that great city, and then it explains why, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. She fell because she gives the nations what? Wine. Her false teachings we're going to notice. By the way, towards the end of time, God is going to give even a more pointed warning to the world. Notice Revelation chapter 18, verses 2 and 3. And I don't have time to get into all of the details about this, but if you look at the context where this passage is, Revelation 18, 2 and 3, you're going to find that it's right in the middle of the passage that deals with the seven last plagues. It's a warning of God to, to his people to get out of Babylon before Babylon receives the plagues. So it's dealing with the end time. Notice Revelation 18, 2 and 3. A mighty angel descends from heaven, and it says, And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations, notice the reason why she fell and the reason why she's filled with demons is all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. You see, Babylon, by drinking the wine that she acquired from the nations, she got drunk, and then she shares her intoxicating wine with the world so that they get drunk along with her. Because she rejected the message of the first angel. She rejects the Sabbath. She rejects the law of God. Or she seeks to change the law of God. She says it doesn't matter what you eat or what you drink. She delves into the occult. She believes that the dead really aren't dead. Etc. Etc. Now let's look more carefully at what this wine is. Remember, the wine is equal to her what? To her abominations. Biblically. Now let's notice the meaning of the word abominations. Abominations. 
The first thing that the Bible calls an abomination is making idols and worshiping them. Notice Deuteronomy chapter 7 verses 25 and 26. And remember this system. I know that you know which system we're talking about. I, I haven't identified this system yet. I'm going to do it at the end. But I want you to notice what the abominations are. What the wine is. Deuteronomy 7, 25 and 26. God says, You shall burn the carved images of their gods, that is of the nations, with fire. You shall not covet the silver or gold that is on them nor take it for yourselves, lest you be snared by it, for it is an abomination to the Lord your God. Nor shall you bring an abomination, that is idols, into your house, lest you be doomed to destruction like it. You shall utterly detest it, utterly abhor it, for it is an accursed thing. Let me ask you, does God really resent the worship of idols? Inclining yourself before idols? Absolutely. How could he be clearer? I, he utterly detests it. He utterly abhors it. And he calls it a cursed thing. Notice Deuteronomy chapter 27 and verses 14 and 15. Deuteronomy 27, 14 and 15. And the Levites shall speak with a loud voice and say to all the men of Israel, Cursed! The Levites, by the way, were the religious teachers in Israel. Cursed is the one who makes a carved or molded image. An abomination to the Lord. The work of the hands of the craftsman. And sets it up in secret. And all the people shall answer and say what? Amen. By the way, does the second commandment of God's law forbid the worship of idols and the making of idols? The Bible is absolutely abundantly clear. And I want you to remember this. Because when we talk about the identity of the beast... In our 10th lecture, we're going to deal with this specific issue. Exodus 20, verses 4 through 6. You shall not make for yourself a carved, carved image. You shall not make for yourself what? A carved image. Any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth, you shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a what? Jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. Does God forbid making idols and bowing before those idols? The fourth commandment explicitly forbids it. But do you know there's another abomination that God calls so in the Old Testament? Notice what we find in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 9 through 12. Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 through 12. God is warning Israel about something they should not do when they enter the land of Canaan. When you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. What abominations? Let's continue reading. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire. We'll come back to that a little bit later. Or one who practices what? Witchcraft. Or a soothsayer. Or one who interprets omens. Or a sorcerer. Or one who conjures spells. Or a medium. Or a spiritist. Or one who calls up the dead. Let me ask you, what is the underlying doctrine behind all of these practices? It's the idea that the dead are not really what? Are not really dead. It's the immortality of the soul that, st that stands behind this. And any church that tells you that you can pray for the dead or you can pray to the dead, you need to be very careful about that church. Because that is forbidden. It's called an abomination in the Holy Word of God. Notice verse 12. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. Do you know what another abomination is? Saying that you don't have to keep God's law is an abomination. You say, where does the Bible say such a thing? Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 9. Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 9 says... One who turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is what? 
is an abomination. So when you turn your ear away from the law, you say, we don't have to keep the law. The law was nailed to the cross. We're not under law, but under grace. God doesn't expect obedience from us. As a fruit of our justification, or as a fruit of His grace, you need to be very careful, because we're told in this verse that the prayer of an individual who turns away his ear from the law is an abomination in the sight of the Lord. Now I want you to notice also Proverbs 15, verses 8 and 9. Relating to this same point, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. What is wickedness? Wickedness is disobeying God's what? God's law. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. So can you sacrifice and still be abominable to the Lord? Sure you can, if you're disobedient, if you're wicked. But the prayer of the upright is his delight. The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but he loves him who follows what? Righteousness. But do you know, not only those who turn away their ear from hearing the law, is that an abomination, but another thing that's an abomination is thinking that you can be saved by your good works. By going on pilgrimages, by paying penance, or doing other things, thinking that you can earn your salvation like the Pharisees thought. Notice what Jesus had to say in Luke chapter 16 and verse 15. Luke 16 verse 15. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men, which is the idea that you can be justified by your works, for what is highly esteemed by men is what? Is an abomination in the sight of God. Thinking that you don't have to listen to the law is an abomination, and thinking that you can be saved by keeping the law is also an abomination. So we need to look out for uh, churches who say, well, you know, we don't have to worry about the law as Christians. Jesus kept it. You know, we're under grace and we turn away our ear from hearing the law, we also have to fear for churches that say that you have to fulfill a whole bunch of requirements in order for God to accept you, in order for you to be saved. In other words, people who say they can be saved by their works, that's an abomination. People who say they can be saved in their sins, that is also an abomination. Do you know what else is an abomination? Fornication or adultery. Let me ask you, does the harlot practice fornication? She most certainly does. Is that an abomination in the sight of the Lord? To fornicate with the kings of the earth? For the church to be involved with the, with the political powers of the world? Absolutely. Notice Jeremiah 13, 26 and 27. Jeremiah 13, 26 and 27. Therefore, I will uncover your, uncover your skirts over your face, that your shame may appear. I have seen your adulteries and your lustful nighings, the lewdness of your harlotry, your abominations on the hills in the fields. Woe to you, O Jerusalem! Will you still not be made clean? Once again, the idea of harlotry, the idea of, of fornication, is spoken of as an abomination in the sight of God. And the harlot, of course, fornicates with the kings of the earth. Do you know what else is an abomination according to Scripture? Thinking that you can eat anything and everything. God gave certain prescriptions about certain kinds of foods that can be eaten and others that cannot be eaten. Notice Deuteronomy chapter 14 and verse 3. Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 3. This chapter contains a list of the types of flesh that can be eaten or cannot be eaten. And notice how the chapter begins. You shall not eat any detestable thing. Now that word detestable is the identical word that is translated repeatedly in the Old Testament, abominable thing. And then it gives a list of the animals, the clean animals that could be eaten, and the unclean animals that could not be eaten. So if you find a church that says you can eat anything and everything, it doesn't make any difference whatsoever, the Bible calls that an abomination. Another thing that the Bible calls an abomination, part of the wine of Babylon, is burning your children to the god Molech. And you say, well, I don't know of any church that allows for the burning of their children. Praise the Lord for that. But I want you to notice that what is important here is the principle behind it. Let's read the text, and then I'll tell you what the principle behind it is. Jeremiah 32 and verse 35. And they built the high places, speaking about Israel, the high places of Baal, 
which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire to Melech, which I did not command them, nor did it come into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. Do you know what the principle is behind this? Do you know why Israel and the ancient nations burned their children to God? Because they believe that God was a wrathful God. God is a God who is angry. And in order to appease Him, you had to burn your children to the God Molech. So any church that gives the image that God is a vengeful God, that God is waiting to throw you into hell if you misbehave, in principle, is doing the same thing as what Israel did in the Old Testament, even if we don't burn our children to any God. Another thing which the Bible calls abomination is the shedding of innocent blood. Does the harlot shed innocent blood of those who don't agree with her? Absolutely. Ezekiel 22 and verse 2. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Now, son of man, will you judge? Will you judge the bloody city? Yes, show her all her abominations. And Proverbs 17 verse 15 says, He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the just. So any church that in its history has condemned the just and justified the wicked, what is this? Both of them are alike, what? An abomination to the Lord. Another thing that the Bible calls an abomination is homosexuality. And I know that it's not politically correct to deal with this, but the Bible says it. Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 2 says, You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Now I'd like to talk about the greatest abomination of all that is spoken of in the Old Testament. The greatest abomination that the Bible describes, the greatest description of the wine, the fermented wine, is worshiping the sun. Notice Ezekiel chapter 8, Ezekiel chapter 8 and verses 16 and 17. As I mentioned in our last lecture, uh, God shows Ezekiel an abomination and Ezekiel says, wow, that's pretty bad, Lord. And God says, you haven't seen anything yet. I'm going to show you worse abomination than that one. He says, really? So God shows him an abomination that's worse. By the way, one of those abominations is worshiping the sun god and the moon god. Or the moon goddess. Interesting. We'll come back to that a little bit later on in our series. So God shows him another abomination. He says, wow, this has got to be the worst. Worst. God says, no, no, no. There's one that's worse than that. And finally, you get to the worst abomination of all. Notice what it says in Ezekiel 8, 16 and 17. So he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And there at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about 25 men. These are the leaders, by the way, the religious leaders. About 25 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east. And they were worshiping the sun toward the east. And he said to me, have you seen this, O son of man? Is it a trivial thing to the house of Judah to commit the abominations? Notice that sun worship is called abomination. Commit the abominations which they commit here. For they have filled the land with violence. Then they have returned to provoke me to anger. Indeed, they put the branch to their nose. In other words, they flaunt themselves and say, God, what are you going to do about it? Sun worship. Let me ask you, is it just perhaps true that at the end of time, this harlot church is going to impose something having to do with sun worship? You say, well, I don't know any church in the world that practices sun worship. Well, I know some pagan religions in the world that practice sun worship, but, you know, any Christian church that openly says you need to worship the sun, I don't know any. But you see, at the end of time, what happened literally in the Old Testament has a symbolic meaning at the end of time. Is it just perhaps true that what's going to happen at the end of time is not that people are going to worship the sun, but they're going to worship on the day of the sun that came into the Christian church, by the way, from the sun-worshipping Romans. It can be proved historically. 
And I'm going to show you a quotation from John Paul II where he says that the church Christianized the day of the sun. As if you can do something like that. You say, well, pastor, it's not the same thing to worship the sun as it is to worship on the day of the sun. Or what people call Sunday. Let me tell you that it is the same thing in principle. You say, how's that? Let me ask you, who created the sun? God did. Did he create the sun for worship? No, it's a secular object, right? It's to give us light. So he did not create the sun for worship. So what happens if you convert the sun into an object of worship? What is that called? Idolatry. Now let me ask you, who created the first day of the week? God did. Did he create it for worship? No, it's one of the working days, folks. Did he create the first day of the week, of the, of the week for worship? No. So what happens if you convert it into a holy day of worship? It is still idolatry. It doesn't matter if it's, if it's an object or if it's a day. Anything that man makes for worship that God did not make for worship is idolatry. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Now, as we studied last time, God is going to have a pe- people who are faithful to him that are going to sigh and cry because of these abominations, this specific one that we've talked about last. Notice Ezekiel chapter 9. Ezekiel chapter 9 and verse 1. Then he called out in my hearing. This is immediately after he describes the group of leaders that were worshiping the sun. In the temple of God, by the way. These are, these are the followers of God that are doing this. It's not the pagans. Immediately after that, it speaks about a group who are going to get a seal on their forehead. They're opposite. Notice verse 1. Then he called out in my hearing with a loud voice saying, Let those who have charge over the city draw near, each with a deadly weapon in his hand. And suddenly six men came from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with his battle axe in his hand. One man among them was clothed with linen. I don't have time to prove this, but it's Jesus Christ who is clothed with linen and had a writer's inkhorn at his side. In other words, something to seal with. They went in and stood beside the, beside the bronze altar. Now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub where it had been to the threshold of the temple. And he called to the man clothed with linen who had the writer's inkhorn at his side. And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city. Which city? Jerusalem. Is this a sealing of God's people or is it a sealing of the pagans? This is happening among God's people. They're worshiping the sun, but there's a group that don't, and they need to receive a seal. Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. Let me ask you, was there a group that sighed and cried about the abominations and did not participate in those abominations, who refused to worship the sun god? Absolutely. And what did they receive? The mark where? On their foreheads. Is there a mark on the forehead in Revelation? Is it just possible that it has something to do with sun worship? We'll come back to that. Verse 5. To the others he said in my hearing, Go after him through the city and kill. Do not let your eyes spare nor have any pity. Utterly slay old and young men, maidens and little children and women. But... Do not come near anyone on whom is the mark. Are those who have the mark protected? Yes, they are. And begin where? At my sanctuary, where the religious leaders were, incidentally. So they began with the elders, where the, uh, the elders um, who were before the temple. And some people say, Pastor Boy, are you saying that those who received the seal when Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed the city, they were spared? And those individuals who were committing the abominations, those were destroyed? That's exactly what I'm saying, because this is the Old Testament scenario. And so you're saying, Pastor Boy, you're saying that those who worship the sun, uh, those were destroyed, whereas those who kept God's holy Sabbath were spared? Are you saying that Jerusalem was destroyed because they didn't keep the Sabbath? Let's let the Bible tell us. Go with me to Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 27. Jeremiah 17 and verse 27. It's very, very clear. God tells us why he destroyed the city of Jerusalem through Nebuchadnezzar. And he already told us in Ezekiel chapter 9 that those who had the seal on their foreheads would not be destroyed because they were not practicing the abominations. They were not worshiping the sun. Notice Jeremiah 17 verse 27. God says, 
But if you will not heed me to hallow, that is to sanctify the Sabbath day, such as not carrying a burden when entering the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, what does God say he's going to do? Then I will kindle a fire in its gates, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. Was Jerusalem destroyed because she was trampling upon God's holy Sabbath? Absolutely. This text needs to be studied along with the passage in Ezekiel. I want to read you a statement from one of my favorite books on Bible prophecy, probably my favorite book. It's called The Great Controversy. See, we've gone through all of the biblical material. Now let me read a comment from somebody who wrote about what the wine is. Notice what the author says. Great Controversy, page 389. When faithful teachers expound the word of God, there arise men of learning, ministers professing to understand the scriptures, who denounce sound doctrine as heresy, and thus turn away inquirers after truth. Were it not, listen to this, were it not that the world is hopelessly intoxicated with the wine of Babylon, multitudes would be convicted and converted by the plain cutting truths of the word of God. But religious faith appears so confused and discordant that the people know not what to believe as truth. And then she says this, the sin of the world's impenitence lies at the door of the church. Powerful statement very much in harmony with Scripture. You see, the wine represents the counterfeit or apostate teachings of an apostate Christendom. It represents pagan practices that have come into the church. It represents doctrines that are contrary to Scripture. And unfortunately, we live in a world today, in a postmodern world, where truth doesn't matter very much anymore. People say, let's just get along. You know, let's just love one another. Let's not debate and talk about truth or doctrine. It doesn't make any difference. God says that it makes a difference. Because he contrasts the wine with the truth of the first angel's message. In fact, do you know, folks, that the great trial at the end of time is going to be whether you accept the truth of God or whether you accept the counterfeit and the miracles that are performed by the Antichrist. Notice 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verses 9 through 12. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 9 through 12. It speaks about the coming of the Antichrist. We'll deal with this later in this series. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. With all power. Signs and lying wonders. Notice that the Antichrist is going to do marvelous works. Miracles that we can't deny. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Why do they perish? Why are those who follow the Antichrist, who accept miracles, going to perish? Notice. And with all, uh, all unrighteousness, decep- unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive what? The love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion. It's not that God is doing it, it's that God is allowing it to happen because people choose it that way. In the Bible, God is spoken of as causing that which he allows. And so it says in verse 11, and for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Does truth matter, my dear folks? Truth matters. Doctrine matters. Our practices matter. Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. This book has objective truth. And anyone who teaches contrary to the objective truth of this, of this book is to be feared, according to Scripture, because what they're doing is sharing wine, the wine of Babylon. This is the reason why God calls his people out of battle. See, God doesn't want people in the world to drink the wine because they're going to get the plagues of Babylon. God doesn't want the plagues to fall upon the wicked. They're going to fall upon Babylon. So before the plagues fall, God says, get out of there. Do you think that's a message of love? Of course it is. Notice Revelation 18, 1 through 5. 
After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. Babylon is an apostate Christianity, as we've studied. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. And let me close by saying that this religious system represented by the harlot has introduced all sorts of practices and doctrines that are contrary to Scripture. Let me just mention some of them. Sunday as a day of worship, infant baptism, Lent, venerating the saints, lighting candles, burning incense, bowing down before idols, using special vestments, Easter, doing the sign of the cross, praying for and to the dead, auricular confession, the rosary, the sign of the cross, celibacy, purgatory, convents, pilgrimages, penance, the mass, altars, all of these things are things that are not found anywhere in Scripture. And yet these are things that are spoken of by this system as saying things that we need to do. And in many cases, things that we need to do in order to be saved. I think you know what system I'm talking about. And I'll tell you folks, in succeeding messages, we're going to talk about the other divisions of Babylon. Because this church that I'm referring to is only the pro main protagonist of Babylon. There are two other powers, the false prophet and the dragon. And we're going to talk about those powers in future lectures. May God bless us and help us to assimilate the truth of God and not the wine of Babylon.